also thank Senator Barrasso, and I will be very brief. We just had a couple of finance matters come up uh, here in the last uh, 20 minutes or so. I just want to take a minute and mention the Tribal Restoration Act, the Tribal Resources Restoration Act, a priority for my constituents to help protect the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs and their reservation from the threat of wildfire. It also will help us improve our partnership, one we value with the Forest Service by embracing co-management on parts of the Mount Hood National Forest. The bill directs the USDA and the Forest Service to enter into an MOU with the tribe and develop a management strategy that incorporates the tribe's traditional knowledge of the area and reduces wildfire risk. The Warm Springs are the largest neighbors to the Mount Hood National Forest and are often the first impacted by wildfires that spark in the area. Um, Mr. Chairman, I would just ask unanimous consent to be able to submit a question uh, to Jeff Rupert, Rupert, Office of Wildland, Fire, and Interior. And I would also, as part of the unanimous consent request, uh, Mr. Chairman, would like to submit for the record a letter from the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs in support of this legislation and how it would increase restoration work and restore forest resources in the forest. I want to thank my colleagues, all of them, for this indulgence and chairman and the ranking. Without objection. Be submitted thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Committee will come to order. This morning we are here to discuss a number of pieces of legislation related to wildfires and to forestry. The bills we will be discussing today represent the priorities of members on both sides of the aisle, including many members of this committee who are more than familiar with the topic of wildfire. Furthermore, the bills before us today demonstrate our shared interest in improving the condition of our nation's force and in addressing our nation's wildfire problem. Our committee has discussed at length the impacts of worsening climate conditions and the past mismanagement that has ushered in a new era of fuels and wildfires. Decades of fire suppression and reduced harvesting has led to historic buildup of vegetation or fuel load, which makes our forests unable to withstand the warming temperatures and direct conditions and drier conditions. In fact, Forest Service researchers published a study in Forest Ecology and Management earlier this year documenting that between 1911 and 2011, the density of trees in the dry forest of the West increased six to sevenfold. This overcrowding has also resulted in the average size of a tree and these forests being 50% smaller than in 1911. We've essentially created a perfect storm, and as a result, we have witnessed an increase in the occurrence of the megafires, and communities across the West are suffering from tragic loss of life and property. While agency leaders have talked about correcting this course for some time, it seems that with each passing decade, we're slipping further behind. For example, in the past 10 years, 25% of California's forests burned in wildfires, and in a forest services land was hit particularly hard while 15% of California's private forest land burned in the past 10 years, 39% of national forests burned. In May of 2021, this committee held a hearing to discuss the critical role that our forests play in absorbing and storing carbon emissions and the worsening impact of wildfire on our climate. We concluded that promoting low-density forests through mechanical thinning treatments, uh, prescribed fire and other methods will help clear out the excess growth and make way for healthier trees that can withstand fire and other disturbances. Since, this hear since that hearing, Congress has provided record levels of funding, over $10 billion, to help the federal agencies achieve the paradigm shift. However, despite this unprecedented level of funding and new authorities that Congress has provided, I understand the Forest Service only treated 8% more acres this year. 8%. I also understand that the Forest Service is on track to have its third straight year of declining timber sales. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today about the bottlenecks they face in ramping up these important treatments and what we can learn from private industry. It's non-negotiable at this point. We must get to work at changing the status quo, both the health of our forest and the safety of our communities is at stake. I believe the legislation that we have on the agenda today offers some creative, common sense solutions for addressing these problems. First, I have a bill, Senate Bill 4935, which is the more hasty response to Firefighting Act will enable loggers to better assist in firefighting efforts when they start. In the coal country, in the coal industry, in the coal country, mining companies are required, if you have a mining permit, you must have a certified mine rescue team. That means because sometimes they're in remote areas and we can't get there quick enough with first responders, so you better have someone to save a life immediately. No different than saving a forest. We can do the same. My bill directs the Forest Service to offer basically firefighting training to loggers working on or next to fire-prone national forests and gives them the ability to extinguish a wildfire if they happen to see one start. 
Right now, if lightning strikes and wildfire starts, workers in the area cannot take action to stop it from spreading. Second, I've co-sponsored the Prom- Promoting Effective Force Management Act, introduced by my friend Senator Brasso sitting here, which directs the agencies to undertake a range of activities aimed at reducing fire risk on federal lands. This includes raising the acreage targets for mechanical thinning projects, establishing a training program to modernize and grow the logging workforce. Importantly, the bill also significantly modifies a current agency policy related to retirement benefits for firefighters. Currently, if a federal firefighter has longer than a three-day break in service over a 20-year career, he or more often she must forfeit his or her previously made retirement contributions. Makes no sense. This outdated practice is something I will talk more about when we get our time for questions. Our committee will continue to look at ways to increase retention in our shrinking wildland firefighting workforce, but we hope that addressing this issue today will be another milestone in our efforts. I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. I look forward to hearing from your perspectives on these 12 bills and the issue they seek to address. With that, I'm going to turn to Ranking Member Barrasso for his opening statement. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your leadership in dealing with this issue, your co-sponsorship, and the two of us working together on several pieces of legislation that are on the agenda today because we've had another devastating wildfire season this year. Make no mistake, America's western forests are facing a wildfire crisis, and this crisis isn't going to solve itself. Roughly 63 million of the 193 million acres of the national forest system are at either high or very high risk of catastrophic fire. These at-risk forests are in dire need of management to reduce fire damage. Congress has provided the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management with increased resources and tools. And uh, it's good to have Senator King here because you pointed that out at the last hearing, that we've done what they have asked, and there is more work to be done on their part to respond to the direction of Congress. But this is why the chairman and I have introduced promoting effective forest management in this act. Uh, <laughs> Well, today we are all rowing in the same direction uh, because there is work to be done. And we we're, so thank you, Senator King, for being here and for your active involvement and interest in this issue. This is a bipartisan bill. That doesn't always happen either. But in this committee, we try to do that. And this bipartisan bill is going to hold agencies accountable for the results that they themselves have told us that they must achieve. Forest Service officials have repeatedly testified before this very committee that they need to dramatically increase the pace and scale of wildfire mitigation treatments. Our legislation will hold them to the task by prioritizing results over rhetoric. The legislation directs land management agencies to set annual acreage treatment targets and to drastically increase those targets in the coming years. If these targets aren't met, Agencies must report to Congress any limitations or challenges that have hindered their progress. That includes litigation challenges and permitting delays. Our bill also contains a number of measures to help set agencies up for success. It requires the Forest Service and the BLM to use their existing streamlining authorities for projects that would reduce wildfire risk and improve forest health. Currently, these authorities are optional and are often unused significantly slowing down vital projects. Making them mandatory will help cut red tape and protect our forests. The bill that Senator Manchin and I have together also recognizes and enhances the vital role of our ranchers and farmers play in reducing wildfire risk. Specifically, it directs agencies to develop a strategy to increase the use of grazing as a wildfire mitigation tool. And I had an opportunity this morning to meet with a number of the members of the Wyoming agriculture community who were in this very room to hear about that and to talk about the issues of grazing as a management tool and mitigation tool. This includes expanding the use of targeted grazing and increasing um, issuances of temporary grazing permits. As we've seen in Wyoming, ranchers contribute to practices that create healthier and more resilient landscapes and forests. This bill, the Promoting Effective Forest Management Act, will also halt the Biden administration's destructive efforts to restrict responsible management of mature forests. According to a recent piece written by Nick Smith published in The Hill, quote, at a time when we need more management of fire-prone federal lands, This is a formula for more bureaucracy and red tape that further ties the hands of our public lands managers. So instead of blindly following the misguided agenda, our bill makes it clear that agencies must adhere to the law and to sound science. Finally, our legislation benefits 
the, uh, will benefit our wildland firefighters. As Senator Manchin mentioned, among other changes, it places a cap on the rent that they are forced to pay for agency-provided housing. The provisions will help federal agencies hire and retain wildland firefighters. Our bill enjoys broad support from wide range of organizations, including sportsmen's groups, agriculture organizations, timber companies, private forest owners, and firefighter advocates. Mr. Chairman, I'm very grateful for your partnership in moving this vital legislation forward. I'd also like to welcome Pat O'Toole of Savory, Wyoming, who's going to be testifying today. I'll have a bit more to say about Pat in a few minutes. These are, there are a number of good bills on the agenda today, and I look forward to today's hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. And before we go to our uh, panel, uh, I'll take the liberty to recognize uh, Senator King. He, has, he, has, he can't miss a meeting he has to go to, and I know which one it is. So, Senator King. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate your indulgence. Uh, I don't have a dog in this fight in the sense that Maine's forests are in, almost entirely privately owned. Uh, we have a little bit of the White Mountain National Forest in, in western Maine. I, I guess the, the, the phrase ought to be, I don't have a tree in this forest. Uh, but I feel strongly that we have to move on the bill that that uh, Senator Barrasso outlined. Uh, in 1986, we harvested something like 13 billion board feet off the National Forest last year. It was about three. I don't know what the right number is, but it's somewhere between 13 and three, and I think it's a lot more than three. Uh, in, in, in my view, we are doing a grave disservice to this country by not managing the federal forests adequately uh, on a several fronts. Uh, one is, of course, the fire front that Senator Brasso has talked about. By not managing forests, there's more debris on the floor. There's more uh, uh, on the forest floor. There's, there's more underbrush, and that's what really makes these fires so destructive. So uh, forest fire management is number one. Number two uh, is the environment itself. Uh, the science is that a growing tree, as opposed to a mature tree, sequesters more carbon. And to the extent that we're managing the forests and, and uh, encouraging uh, the growth of younger, smaller diameter trees to become larger diameter trees, we're sequestering more carbon and thereby uh, helping to cope with the, the, the climate crisis. Uh, and then finally is the economic effects. Uh, Senator Risch isn't here, but I've heard, often heard him say that in Idaho 20 or 30 years ago, there were 20 or 30 sawmills. Now there's something like three. And we are, uh, we are really uh, substantially undermining the, uh, the economic uh, forest, forest products industry in the West uh, by not, not having sufficient wood supply. So I think on all three of those bases, we really have to uh, move forward with legislation to increase the sustainable harvest. Forestry is almost the definition of a sustainable industry. Uh, the trees grow back, and they grow back better if they are thinned, if they're managed, if they're pre-commercial thin and uh, thinning, and, and that's what we really need to do. So uh, from an environmental point of view, as well as from a uh, from an economic point of view, I think this legislation is critically important. And of course, the fire issue is, is uh, high on our agenda right now. I, I think one of the issues, and I'm, I'm afraid I, I'm going to listen to your testimony, I don't think I'll be here for questions, but one of the issues is, to what extent is litigation the problem? And it, if it is, we have to figure, out, figure that out. We can't allow uh, protracted uh, litigation we want people to have their say, we want people to be involved, but uh, to, when we allow litigation itself to become a weapon, not in terms of what the outcome is, but in terms of the delay, uh, that's unacceptable. And uh, we have to find a path that allows people to, to be engaged, to make their case, uh, but ultimately we have to make decisions and move forward. And uh, as I say, Maine is the most forested state in the nation. Uh, we have a strong Forest Practices Act that controls things like clear cutting and stream uh, amelioration of effects on stream. All of those issues can be dealt with uh, without, uh, without uh, constraining forestry to the point where we're losing the benefits that it, that it brings about. So uh, Senator Brasso, thank you for your indulgence and uh, I look forward to the hearing. Well, th thanks so much, uh, Senator King. You know, I, I agree. You talk about. Oh, I was turning to Senator Marshall. Would it be out of order to ask them to answer to Senator uh, 
King's question on the litigation before he leaves, because I'd love to hear the answer, too. Okay, uh, that'd be fine with me. And now that the chairman's returned, if we want to run that down the panel, we so, yeah, Senator King had one question, and he has to sure. get to his important meeting. We're going to, to what extent, okay with you to what extent is, is litigation ahead, the ahead. problem? Please. Yeah. You can start it either way. Go ahead. Yeah, Pat. Absolutely. Thank you, Senator. Um, so I have a philosophy of natural resources. It's called the hopefuls and the hatefuls. And what we're trying to do is give, empower the, the hopeful people to do things. Uh, the litigators, as you talked, and let's use the example of the giant sequoias where litigation stopped forest management that caused destructive fires this year um, in, in uh, California. And it... You know, I'm going to show a, um, an example of what our forest looks like right now. And the reason we're not moving forward is the litigation from the industry. I mean, it's an industry, Senator. So you're saying that the, that the, the stoppage of responsible forestry has, in fact, endangered the giant sequoias? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, there's a prodigious um, reporting on it in, the, in all of the media. And, and there was a, a, a Forest Service plan to clean that area up to prevent exactly what happened. So yeah, that's the most recent example that I can tell you, but it's happening in the forest where, where we're working in, on the uh, Route Medicine Bow Forest in Colorado and Wyoming. It's absolutely what has stopped every effort that we've had to try to clean up that forest, which is the headwaters of the Colorado River. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I don't have extensive experience with um, harvesting on uh, federal lands, um, I can say that uh, I think the industry has come to expect relatively low levels of harvest, harvesting, and the expectation is that, or the understanding is that the Forest Service doesn't put up as much timber for sale, in part because of their expectation that legislation or litigation would slow it down. And I think, uh, in many respects, the industry has kind of recalibrated and gotten used to that over the last several years and even decades. Um, so obviously this legislation, if, it, if it's going to unjam some of that and create uh, more direction to engage on, on some of these thinning treatments that are so needed, uh, that would certainly be a very good thing for the forest products industry. Um, thank you, sir. Um, from my perspective, I, I, I think, you know, clearly litigation, you know, has an impact on our you know, planning delivery of programs and projects. I appreciate your observation that, um, which isn't to say that the outcome is necessarily on either end of the spectrum um, um, wrong, but but undoubtedly um, litigation litigation has an effect on how we plan and, and, and deliver programs and projects. I think that's undeniable. And I'll round us out here. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, so in the Forest Service, we do value the role that the public voice gets to play and the role of implementing work on the ground. Um, uh, but unnecessary litigation does have a significant impact on our ability to, to be able to get that work accomplished. And so while we value the voice on one end, uh, having some type of uh, balance of what litigation is um, would be something that we'd, we'd be interested in. Thank you. Now we'll get back. We'll go back to our presentation, and Mr. Crocker, we'll start with you with your statement. All right. Uh, good morning, Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Barrasso, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide the perspectives of the USDA Forest Service on the 12 public land bills under consideration today. Uh, the Forest Service manages 193 million acres of land for multiple uses, provide technical and financial assistance to state and private forestry, or forestry agencies, and makes up the largest forestry research, research organization in the world. I look forward to discussing these bills with you today. Over the last two decades, we've witnessed what, have, what has become now a familiar pattern, bigger and more destructive wildfires that are extremely challenging and costly to suppress. This wildfire crisis calls for a new paradigm, which is outlined in our 10-year wildland fire crisis strategy. We greatly appreciate the significant down payment that Congress has provided through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, that is allowing us to take the initial steps to perform this critical work. The bills we're discussing today will help the agency accomplish more work as efficiently and as effective as possible. The bills will hold us to a higher standard of accountability so we can better meet the goals of the American public that we serve. 
The Civilian Conservation Center Enhancement Act supports the specialized training programs focused on forestry and rangeland management, wildland firefighting, and more. These provisions support the administration's priorities of wildland fire management and workforce development. The USDA strongly supports the intent of this bill and looks forward to working with Congress on technical changes. The Save Our Sequoias Act provides administrative tools and procedures to help address, facing, help address the threats that, are, that, that our giants are, are facing. We recently initiated emergency, emergency fuel reduction treatments to provide for the long-term survival of giant sequoia groves against the immediate threats of wildfire. While the USDA has concerns with the litigation, we appreciate the intent and look forward to continued discussions with Congress on ways to expedite this important work. USDA would like to work with Congress to provide technical assistance on the Small Diameter, Small Diameter Timber and Underutilized Materials Act, which designates free use areas on national forest system that, can, that contain small diameter tree and a fire hazard area. The Natural Infrastructure Act establishes a new science program to respond to the emerging research needs of the private sector and local governments. We, we support the goals of this bill and would like to work with Congress to provide technical assistance. The more hasty response to firefighting act requires the Forest Service and the Department of Interior to build a cadre of local individuals to support initial attack on wildfires. USDA supports the intent of this bill and would like to work with Congress to address some concerns. The Promoting Effective Forest Management Act proposes several changes and updates to Forest Service policies and regulations with the intent of providing more effective management. While we support several of the goals in the bill, we would like to work with Congress to address uh, concerns within the bill language. The Catastrophic Wildfire Prevention Act requires the Forest Service to work collaboratively, collaboratively with state and local forest management agencies to establish a pilot program to identify, research, and establish pre-fire suppression stand density index for certain areas of national forest system and to use this information to benchmark our forest treatments. While we support several of the goals in the bill, we would like to work with Congress to address agency concerns. The Watershed Restoration Initiative Act would provide for the establishment of a new Southwest Ecological Restoration Institute in the state of Utah. U USDA would like to work with Congress to make additional improvements to uh, the underlying authorities for uh, these institutes. S4891 amends Title VI of the Federal Land Management Policy Act of 1976, requiring USDA to develop a pilot program to operate nurseries on national forest system. USDA supports the goal of this bill and looks forward to working with Congress to, to address the nation's replanting backlog. The Firewood Banks Act establishes grants for operation of firewood banks on the federal land and provide trees for firewood. We support the use of firewood banks for those in need of emergency heating and would like to work with Congress to ensure the bills are in line with the Infrastructure, Investment, and Jobs Act and address the concerns with the existing bill language. S4837 amends the, public, the Omnibus Public Land Management Act of 2009, establishing a treaty resource emphasis zone within the Mount Hood National Forest. USDA is committed to fulfilling the trust relationship between the United States and tribes and supports the spirit and intent of the bill and would like to work with Congress on technical clarifications. And finally, the Hermes Peak Calf Canyon, Calf Canyon Forest Restoration Program Relief Act amends the Emergency Forest Restoration Program, waiving the cost share requirement for lands damaged by the Hermit Peak Calf Canyon Fire. USDA looks forward to working with Congress to provide timely compensation for the victims of the Hermit's Peak Calf Canyon Fire. This concludes my remarks, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you. First of all, I'm going to introduce the panel. I'm, we got a little bit off, off base here, but we're going to get back. Uh, Mr. Crockett uh, is the uh, Associate Deputy from the Forest Service, and, and, and thank you for your testimony. We have also Mr. Jeff Rupert from the Department of Interior's Office of Wildland Fire. We have Mr. Jim Hortican, CEO of Lime uh, Timber Company. And finally, we have Mr. Pat O'Toole from the Family Farm Alliance. And now we'll go to Mr. Rupert. Good morning, Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Barrasso, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you to, to provide testimony on wildland fire management and forest management legislation. I believe that the bills being discussed today provide important tools, authorities, and resources to reduce wildfire risk and improve the resiliency of our nation's forest, rangelands, and grasslands. Climate change continues to play an oversized role in the extreme fire weather that we're experiencing across the nation. A drier and hotter climate results in low fuel moisture that frequently leads to extreme conditions that produce the larger, more intense wildfires that we're experiencing. In recent years, nearly every western state has experienced prolonged periods of high to extreme fire danger affecting 
hundreds of millions of acres of land. Many of these areas are in the wildland urban interface where communities in the West are increasingly exposed to wildfire. This year, the nation reached a high of preparedness level four on September 8th and remained there for 10 days. This is in contrast to last year when the nation remained at PL4 or five for a record 99 consecutive days starting in late June. What we have observed this year is more of a gradual movement of wildfire across the nation. Even with this, many geographic regions of the country experienced catastrophic wildfire events, including in the Southwest where New Mexico experienced the largest wildfire in its history. We are undeniably in the midst of a wildfire crisis that's being driven by climate change. Through President Biden's bipartisan infrastructure law, the department is receiving nearly $1.5 billion to manage and reduce wildfire risk by improving the resiliency of our nation's forests, rangelands, and grasslands through hazardous fuels management and post-fire restoration. Funding also supports efforts to bolster wildland firefighter pay and promote firefighter safety and long-term mental health. So far this year, the department has allocated $180 million in funding with plans to address a program total of nearly 2 million acres of hazardous fuels, and 1 million acres of restoration treatments. A portion of this investment also supports short-term suppl supplemental pay increases for 3,800 interior firefighters um, and programs that expand support for firefighter mental health and wellness, as well as science and research to improve the monitoring and assessment of mitigation and restoration work and to better understand the impacts of climate change on wildfire. I believe the goals and objectives of the bills being considered today in combination with the backing of the bipartisan infrastructure law can further advice, ad, advance excuse me, the department's efforts to reduce wildfire risk, achieve additional wildland firefighter workforce reforms, and strengthen the interagency response to wildfire. S4883 Save Our Sequoias Act would codify the Giant Sequoia Lands Coalition to provide recommendations on the stewardship of Giant Sequoia um, the bill authorizes emergency response activities to protect giant sequoia and establishes strike teams to carry out protection projects. The department supports the goals of the legislation and would like to work with the sponsor on additional clarifications to the bill. S4835, the Small Diameter Timber and Underutilized Material Act, provides for the removal of small diameter trees from fire hazard areas at no cost to individuals. The department supports the goals of this legislation. I um, would like to work with a sponsor to minimize any potential economic impacts to counties that receive a portion of receipts from timber sales, particularly those in Western Oregon. Um, S4877, the Civilian Conservation Centers Enhancement Act would establish civilian conservation centers to train youth in forest and rangeland management, wildfire management, and other mission areas. The department supports the goals of the legislation, would like to work with a sponsor to ensure that the interests of the department are incorporated into the training um, in addition to addressing other technical changes. S4884, the Natural Infrastructure Act would establish a joint natural infrastructure science program with USDA Forest Service for the purpose of fostering and disseminating science on natural infrastructure. The department strongly supports the legislation as a way to utilize nature-based infrastructure solutions to address climate goals and would like to work with a sponsor on technical modifications to the bill. S4891, to amend Federal Land Policy and Management Act of 1976, directs the department to establish and operate tree nurseries on B Bureau of Land Management public lands. The department supports the goals of the bill and would like to work with a sponsor to expand the scope to include nurseries, propagating native species um, in order to address a wider range of restoration needs. S4904, Promoting Effective Forest Management Act, includes a wide range of forest management provisions and wildland firefighter workforce reform. The department supports the goals of the legislation. We'd like to work with the sponsor to address um, issues. S4935, the More Hasty Response to Firefighting Act, would establish a training program for landowners and employees of companies authorized to carry out activities on forest service and BLM land. The department supports the objectives of the legislation and would like to work with the sponsors to facilitate and encourage more rapid response, as well as to ensure appropriate training and safety measures are in place. And finally, uh, S4944, the Firewood Banks Act, would establish a pilot program to provide affordable firewood as a heating source for individuals for re residential use. The department supports the goals of the bill and would like to work with the sponsor on several clarifications. Concludes my uh, statement. Happy Thank you, sir. Mr. Hordekan. 
Great. Chairman Manchin, Ranking Member Barrasso, and members of the committee, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today about workforce development in the logging industry. My name is Jim Herdican, and I'm the CEO of the Lime Timber Company, a timberland investment management organization with 1.4 million acres of timberland in the U.S., including 165,000 acres in Senator Manchin's home state of West Virginia. While logging doesn't attract much attention as an essential industry, it is a critical link in the forest product supply chain, an industry that employs over 950,000 people and provides Americans with everything from housing to paper products. Loggers also play a critical role in restoring U.S. forests in need of thinning to prevent forest fires, work that is needed on a massive scale in the western U.S. I started my career in logging 23 years ago when a logger agreed to take me on as a partner in his small logging business. We formed a company and borrowed $200,000 from the local farm credit to purchase a log forwarder. I started out felling trees with a chainsaw and learned the ropes of small business through trial and error. Back then, we employed eight people, six of whom ran chainsaws. We produced about one million board feet of logs per year. The business now produces over 10 million board feet a year with 16 people in its logging division, a tenfold increase in production with only a doubling of the headcount. I share this experience because it is representative of the transformation that has occurred in logging over the past 30 years. Employment in logging has declined by 41% from 86,000 in 1990 to under 50,000 today, a decline of 2% per year. However, logging output has remained nearly flat, so reductions in, in employment have been almost completely offset by increases in productivity. Increased productivity and lower employment have been driven by mechanization. Over the past 30 years, we have shifted from tree felling with chainsaws to tree felling with mechanical harvesters. The industry has become safer and more professionalized with best management practices, training requirements, and forest certification. Mechanization and increased productivity in combination with generally flat demand for logging services have resulted in a logging workforce that has aged in place and become older, even in comparison to other industries. And now there are signs that logging capacity is becoming more constrained. In West Virginia and Tennessee, for example, we have seen logging businesses close because the owners could not recruit qualified workers. This began before the pandemic, but has gotten worse over the past few years. We are harvesting well below our growth equivalent target levels because we do not have adequate logging capacity. To address safety and workforce recruitment, we started an in-house logging crew in West Virginia in 2019. The system uses a specialized base machine with winches to tether a machine that mechanically fells timber on steep slopes. While we are thrilled with the safety and environmental benefits of this new system, we have struggled to make it work financially. Our single greatest challenge has been the recruitment of enough qualified people, skilled equipment operators, and leadership to increase production and achieve profitability. By my rough estimate, it would take 2,000 logging crews and maybe 10,000 additional skilled equipment operators to treat an additional 2 million acres of western forests per year. That's a 20% increase in the current logging workforce. Without major investments in workforce development, I don't see how we get there. In my written testimony, I've described the challenges to workforce recruitment in the logging sector, including low profit margins and wages, physically demanding work, safety challenges, and limited technical training. I believe the market for logging services, principally landowners and mills, is beginning to address profit margins and logger compensation, but many of the other challenges cannot be addressed by the private sector alone. I've identified four approaches the federal government could take to begin addressing the challenges. First, long-term contracts on federal lands. To invest in thinning equipment and workforce training, logging companies need to be able to combine traditional timber sales with stewardship projects that make sense within a logical work area and provide security of work for multiple years. Second, incentives for apprenticeship programs. Hiring an inexperienced worker to learn how to operate a $500,000 machine is expensive and risky. The government could create tax credits or direct reimbursements to help contractors with the cost of establishing apprenticeship programs. Third, we need public-private partnerships to assist the logging industry, equipment manufacturers, and equipment dealers in developing and deploying technical training to logging crews they are starting up new systems and hiring new employees. And finally, if we are going to meet the challenge of thinning western U.S. forests to reduce fire risk, we will need to make large and long-term investments in vocational and technical education. Sustaining the forest products industry in the U.S. while responsibly growing, harvesting, and restoring our nation's forests 
will require government and industry to collaborate in new ways to develop the logging workforce of the future. And with that, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to speak to the committee today. Thank you. Now I'll turn to Senator Brasso for our next introduction. Well, thanks, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to introduce and welcome Pat O'Toole back to the committee. He is the president of the Family Farm Alliance. He's a rancher and a hay grower and a former member of Wyoming's House of Representatives. Pat and his wife Sharon live and work on a ranch located near Savory, Wyoming. Primarily a sheep and cattle operation, the ranch has been in Sharon's family since 1881, which I'd point out, Mr. Chairman, was nine years before Wyoming even became a state. Uh, the O'Toole family and the latter ranch were the recipients of the 2014 Wyoming Leopold Environmental Stewardship Award, and just last month, Pat was inducted into the Wyoming Agriculture Hall of Fame. Uh, needless to say, he is very well equipped to discuss the nexus between livestock grazing, responsible land stewardship, and wildfire mitigation. So Pat, again, thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Senator and Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator Risch, Senator Heinrich, thank you so much for this opportunity. And I'm a little bit nervous today because, not, not particularly because I'm in front of the committee, but because of how important this is. We have to fix this. And, you know, in, in my testimony, I'm going to refer to my personal observations. And, Zach, if you'd put this up, um, we graze the Route Medicine Bow National Forest, which is a forest in both Colorado and Wyoming. Our valley uh, has a river that, ro that crosses the state line 32 times. So our ranch is in both states, Colorado and Wyoming. Our forests are in Colorado and Wyoming. And, you know, maybe the benefit to the committee is I have pretty wide uh, understanding of how the system works because we're in both forests with and two BLMs. You know, we, we understand the concept of, of how the regulatory system works. This is my grazing allotment. This isn't just 10 acres or 100 acres or 1,000 acres. This is hundreds of thousands of acres in the northwest Colorado, which is the headwaters of the Colorado River, one of the most threatened uh, water systems in the United States and the world. Um, a forest like this does not generate water. Why is the Family Farm Alliance so strongly for this bill? Because we understand that the water system is dependent on the forest system. We work with the Bureau of Reclamation across the western United States. Every Bureau of Reclamation Irrigation District has a forest with issues like this. And the inability of the system to absorb um, the need, the money is there. You all have put the money into the system. The desire is there. And I'll give you a couple of personal um, observations. I, uh, the Vice President of the Senate in, in Wyoming is Larry Hicks, probably the best person to put um, conservation on the ground that I've ever heard of. I said to him last year, how long in your 30-year career, how much have you gotten down of your vision? He said, maybe 20% because they won't let me in the forest. So we are a um, joint chiefs. Um, in the Joint Chiefs process. This is the first year, so we got a late start because the dollars didn't come. He's going to do 2,000 acres of treatment on private and state land, 76 acres on the forest. Killed him. What does that tell you? There's an impediment in the system to, to being successful in implementing. That's why your <laughs> bill is so critically important. This is about implementation. There has to be a direction to the agencies that something gets done. And I've been on multiple tours with Nature Conservancy, with Trout Unlimited, as well as forest owners. In, in southern Wyoming, the Saratoga Mill um, needs 12 or 25 loads a day to keep in business. They're getting 12, and they've been told we're going to cut you back 40%. Why is that? Why is there this gap between a, a mill in Craig, Colorado, that says, if you will guarantee me 10 years of timber, I will invest $7 million tomorrow of my own money to expand the, the uh, Operation. So there's some disconnect going on of, of why the best programs that are, that are out there um, that supposedly are going to move us to the success that we know that we need, why is, why is it not happening? And I think you, we're going to have to pedal, put the pedal down and force the activities that we know need to happen. Um, you know, a bunch of my friends, ranchers from Wyoming, are here today, as well as uh, Senator Rich, a bunch of your People are with the Family Farm Alliance. Uh, we've had meetings all week with Forest Service, with the <clears throat> Interior, USDA. Two things happen with food on the national forest. One is the grazing part. In our family, is cattle. We tell people cattle, sheep, horses, dogs, and children. Our, our wool goes to the dress uniforms for the military. We're proud of being part of the system. 
but the, the impediments of not being able to graze this are exactly why our business is at, at risk. Um, but the second part that really hasn't been well discussed is the water that's generated from the national forest system throughout the West is the water that we, create, we make food with. And that food is, is now um, clearly uh, restricted. That food uh, from my place in, on the Colorado water, uh, Wyoming line to the Yuma and, and the Imperial Irrigation District in California, the entire system is at risk because we can't generate enough water to grow the crops that we know that we need to have. Um, you know, I, I would also like to support um, Senator Luhan's both the bill on, uh, uh, on uh, cost share and with the terrible things that happened in New Mexico. Uh, we have members there and we're very familiar with what happened there and also um, Senator Merkley and Danes have a, an infrastructure bill that's critical. And this is gonna be everything from the, um, from the sublime to mind mundane to fix. It's going to be big picture stuff. It's going to be little picture stuff. Your uh, comments, Mr. Uh, Hurtigan, about how difficult it is to recruit. So I have three different groups in Colorado and Wyoming that want to invest money. All they need is a, is a facilitated um, uh, process because the, um, you know, as, as uh, um, the senator said earlier, that the, the it, litigation industry has been ter terrorized the ability to fix these forests. And what we need is the tools, which is what you're given in this bill, and, and as, as time goes on, further tools, because we have to demand success. We cannot accept failure in this particular enterprise. Thank you so I'm much. I'm gonna thank all of you for your testimony, and now we'll go through our questions. And if it's some, sometimes it seems like we're rushing you a little bit, we only have five minutes trying to acknowledge everybody yes, here, so the quicker your answers, the better. Yes. And I wanna start right with you, Mr. Toll, because this really pricked me, my interest here. I've always been, I said, my goodness, could those, could those trees, I'm understanding now the trees are diseased, so there's no value in those trees. That's actually, in, it, since I testified here in June, I've yeah. spent a lot of time investigating. These could be the coal plant in, in uh, Colorado that's being decommissioned. The county commissioner is looking at these kind of trees being the fuel for um, part of a to, to cut down, cut down, cut, cut down the pollution, right, and air, air okay, quality. I got that. Uh, but could those trees have been identified earlier and been cut and salvaged before they got diseased? Uh, absolutely. And this, but uh, you're not allowed to do that, right? It is so complicated and the I got process isn't, isn't made to, to deal with this. But I can tell you that the markets are developing for this kind of, for example, the fellow wants to invest the $7 million in yeah. a big wood straw. That's what you put on a, for, a forest after a fire to have a bio, biological um, for the rejuvenation. Well, we have a lot of Western centers here know a lot more about BLM than I do, but I'm learning about it. It doesn't make any sense to me at all when we have these horrific fires. The law of that, if we can get back in early enough, we could salvage a lot of that, but then it has to stand for so long that it becomes basically non-valuable. And this kind of common sense has got to change. We really do. I think, that forget about the politics. It just doesn't make any sense for, yes, for our country or our economy. With that, I'll go, uh, Mr. Uh, Porterquin, I, I want to ask you on yours. Uh, uh, first of all, I know that your operations in West Virginia, I appreciate them very much, and the people that have opportunities appreciate what you do. But if you could explain to me, uh, your testimony, you said several things that Lime Timber is doing, including uh, uh, in West Virginia to grow the logging uh, the workforce. Tell us more about the type of training required to operate the machinery you're, that you are describing and how an equipment dealer uh, training credit for an in-the-field training or apprenticeship program might work. How, how you're navigating that? Well, that's a great question. And the, the training that we've implemented has really been on-the-job training, and that's really been what the industry has relied on for many, many years uh, in an industry that really didn't need to recruit uh, labor because of the productivity gains that were occurring. Um, there really haven't been much in the way of formalized training programs. Uh, we've found in West Virginia that creates a real challenge. If you're taking somebody who's never operated a 50-ton machine before and you're putting them in or her in a, a cab of a machine on, on the side of a hill, um, there's a lot to learn all at once. Um, what we've found is um, you know, funding that and doing that on our own, it's really a matter of um, taking a new operator, giving them easy ground to work on initially, having low expectations for productivity, uh, during the learning curve phase, 
and then gradually bringing in um, experienced operators who can coach and mentor and provide additional. They're working pretty well for you. Uh, it, it is, but it's, it, I mean, the, the question that we have and what we would like to see is, uh, it, can we accelerate the learning curve? And if we have programs like uh, those that have been developed, some in the United States, but more so in other countries yeah. um, that really focus on intensive training, can we, can we accelerate the learning curve and, and build up a workforce? Mr. Rupert, Mr. Crockett, the next one's for you. Uh, we talked about the firefighter retirement three-day, I mean, none of this makes sense at all. So uh, uh, if you can explain to me uh, how we can correct this, or basically, uh, is, it, is it codified by law? You have to do it that way, or is that in-house, basically, your, your, uh, the way you operate in, in, in your agencies? And what can be done to change, or do you see a change coming? Or do you need us to make the change for you? So I don't mind going first on this one. So thank you for the question. So it's actually a, a statutory and regulatory, and uh, we'd invite a conversation. So we feel like the real experts are at our Office of Personnel Management, okay. OPM. So we'd invite a conversation between the- Are you all recognizing that this, there's just an inequity there? I mean, something has to change. It doesn't make any sense at all that a person, I'm understanding, if a firefighter takes more than a three-day break in service, and they've been there for over 20 years, uh, they not only lose their retirement benefits, they also lose all the money they previously paid into the system, too. That's the way it's codified? It, is it codified, or is that what you all interpret it? So, my, so, so, so there is code for, for that special retirement, those benefits. The, my understanding of the three-day break, that that's, that's within the regulatory framework. You can change that without us changing the code. Well, so I, maybe just to add a little bit, um, you know, I think it's, one really important aspect to figure out is as we talk about wildland firefighters break in service, recognizing that the same, um, the same sort of challenge and concern um, um, affects other sectors of federal employment. So this, so this, this touches more I than just you. federal wildland firefighters. So there's a strong consideration there. I think to your point, we, we do regularly hear that this is an Let issue for firefighters. Let me ask this. Are you all opposing the changes we would make if we codified and changed the law? I mean, I, I don't want... The worst thing we can do is we, we do something with well-intended here, ends up in, by the time you all decipher through the agencies what you want to do, and then we get in a tit-for-tat back and forth. We don't want that to do. If you see the inequity here, the unfairness to the system, we can clarify it for you very, very quickly. We just want to make sure you all adhere to it. Right. If you think it's unfair. From, from my perspective, I think it's really important to, to recognize, I mean, there's sort of an equity we know, issue we know across be, the government, and, and, but to your point, I mean, I regularly hear from wildland firefighters that three-day break in service is a real, has a real impact. And you all, and, and you're compassionate about that. You think we could change if we can, if we can carve this out and select so we don't cross over into your jur other jurisdictions. I think is what you're saying, Ms. Crockett. Do you all agree too? Yeah, it's it's really important to our firefighters, and if we can get it figured out, okay. it's going to make life easier. I got you. With that, we'll go to Senator Brasso. Well, thanks, Ms. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. O'Toole, one of the major themes of our legislation is promoting positive cultural changes within the Forest Service and the BLM. It requires employees to become more familiar with the streamlining tools that Congress has given them to reduce wildfire hazards or wildlife wildfire hazards. It also incentivizes employees to remain in the communities longer. Uh, can you talk about how these provisions would actually help improve agency culture and foster better relationships between the agency and then the state and local and, and then the private sector partners? Yes, sir. Um, you know, as, as a permittee in, in two states with four agencies, this is something we're very familiar with. I'm going to lose a 20-year employee at the Forest Service in the Medicine Bow Forest this year. He's retiring. We have no idea what the implications of the next person is. And so... What happens is the, the new people come in, and, you, and those of us that have been there for a long time become very ignorant for a while until we just reestablish our credibility. And in the long-term relationships that we've had, best BLM guy in the country for 40 years, left and retired, total change, total fundamental change. And now we have in another forest a, a succession of, of employees that come for a year, two years, uh, regional foresters change, or... Uh, local foresters, and it, it, there, there is no incentive, it seems like, to stay and, and be with the community. And the Organic Act of the Forest, for example, is really about communities. And we're seeing a, a, a vast change in sort of uh, this 
uh, move up the chain to the, the way that you do better in the agencies is by moving. That can't be the that can't be the incentive. Thank you, um, Mr. Crockett. The um Last month, NBC News published an article with the following headline. You may have seen it. The Forest Service, it says, is overstating its wildfire prevention progress to Congress, overstating the progress to Congress, despite decades of warnings not to do so. The article details how the Forest Service has for decades used misleading data. This, this news uh, story from NBC says, the Forest Service has counted many of the same pieces of land toward its risk reduction goals for anywhere from two to six times, and in a few cases, dozens of times. I, I think anybody that's read this is very troubled by this, by this report. So would you agree with me that transparency is vital when it comes to combating the wildfire crisis? Yes, uh, I definitely would agree with you that transparency is, is very important, and uh, that's our goal, to be transparent in everything that we do. When we do a forest treatment, many times it requires multiple entry t entries in order to be successful with it, um, generally about three entries. And so we want to be accountable to Congress for every dollar we spend on those entries. And so uh, uh, the first, second, and third entry require reporting, re have reporting requirements to go along with it. So part of our responsibility is to be transparent, to, to say when an acre is treated in multiple times to be able to meet that benefit. So to ensure transparency and eliminate confusion, our bill limits reporting accomplishments to projects that meaningfully actually reduce wildfire risks. So I ask unanimous consent, Mr. Chairman, to enter into the record this NBC News article, the Forest Service is overstating its prevention progress. Without objection, if I may uh, uh, take the privilege of also asking for permission to, uh, to enter into the record a letter to Deb Holland, Secretary of Interior, Tom Vilsack, Secretary of Agriculture, concerning the wild, wild the wildland firefighter personnel request we just spoke about. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. O'Toole, so most of our federal forested lands are already off limits to active forest management projects. Uh, these include lands designated as wilderness, as wild and scenic river corridors, as roadless areas. The Biden administration's executive order on old growth and mature forests has the potential to restrict responsible management on many more uh, additional acres. So at a time with 63 million acres of our national forests at risk of being destroyed by catastrophic wildfires, it's, they're finding that ways to further restrict forest management projects. Is this a wise use of time and resources? Senator, that's an excellent uh, observation and, you know, Perhaps you all remember Carol King, the singer year, uh, years, years, and years ago, um, testified, and it, and it was actually on CNN and Time Magazine. It was a huge story for a few days that we should never touch one more acre, one more tree. This is the reality. You know, picture tells a thousand, a thousand words. Um, the reality is this use of the old growth um, term to restrict use on the forest is, is a, an agenda, not a solution. Uh, and so I think, I think it's very clear that we, you know, base our, our forest management on the need rather than these, um, um, you know, sort of uh, um, manufactured discussions about, about how, how reality works. This is reality. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. And now we'll go to Senator Heinrich. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Deputy Chief Crockett, uh, when President Biden visited New Mexico as the Hermit's Peak Calf Canyon fire still burned. Um, he promised my constituents that the federal government would cover the full cost of the fire for affected residents and business owners. And I very much appreciate the USDA waiving cost shares for many of its programs, but it's my understanding that the department does not have the, the legal authority to do that for the emergency forest restoration program which is precisely why Senator Lujan and I introduced this legislation before us today. Um, will the administration fulfill its commitment to covering the full cost of recovery for the Hermit's Peak Calf Canyon fire and support cost share waivers for EFRP? So, so thank you for the question. And as you stated, uh, President Biden has, has announced that he's uh, fully committed to restoring the 100% um, uh, of the cost of the government um, for the damages for the fire. Uh, but more importantly, I, guess, uh, I think the legislation that's been introduced around the uh, uh, Hermit's Peak uh, Fire Assistance Act would help, uh, help, for, help further that. Great. 
That's a long version of a yes. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mr. Rupert, I wanted to ask you, um, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act tasks both DOI and U.S. Forest Service to create permanent programs to address the mental health of wildland firefighters. And in June of this year, it was announced that the agencies would begin establishing programs to both recognize and address mental health needs for those workforces. Can you just go into a little bit more detail and share any updates you have on the status of that program? And then let us know, um, you know, it, what is the, is it going to be widely available in the 23 season? Yeah, thank you, sir. Um, yeah, so, so as you described, um, we announced a joint, a joint program. Um, so an update on the status of that work. Um, we are actively um, um, leveraging existing mental health support that we have um, in place and so employee assistant program, and um, we've just expanded out some of the coverage through that sort of existing tool. In addition to that, um, we're focused on establishing um, year-round prevention efforts um, for all wildland firefighters, permanent and seasonal. That's Amen. been a concern. Um, in the past, um, we're working to provide PTSD care and enhance critical incident um, stress management capacity. Um, we have allocated and are hiring additional employees for that capacity to provide that support. That's very active right now. Um, we've just hired and onboarded a joint shared position through the Public Health Service to help support trauma services as well as coordinate activities across department. That's a joint shared position. Um, and additionally, we're actively right now working with CDC, National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. There's a current study ongoing and a wildland firefighter survey that's open right now and it will be through this early fall where essentially we are um, identifying specific um, science-based support measures um, that will inform the, the continued development of this joint program. So we're, from my perspective, making good, good progress, ramping up, to use the chairman's term earlier. Great. Thank you very Thank much you. for the update. Uh, Mr. O'Toole, I wanted to ask you, what, what are some of the markets? And, and first, just to make sure I understand um, what we're looking at here. Are, is this Lodgepole? Is that the, yes, sir. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, what are some of the uh, small diameter tree markets that you see promise in? Because we've been able to get through uh, the sort of glut of litigation that was existent in the 1990s in New Mexico. We've now gotten through some really big NEPA planning processes for how to treat large landscapes. But one of the big challenges has simply been that the, the trees we really need to be taking out are small diameter. They don't have the same uh, market uh, value that a large DBH tree in the past would have generated. So um, we need to find a way to get these small trees out of the forest that really drive ladder uh, fuels and hotter fires, um, but they don't have the same market value. So if you see particular um, areas where we can create value from those small trees, I'd, I'd, I'd love your thoughts on that. Well. Uh um, my expertise is not as a logger, I'm, I'm a rancher, but we've, in, in the last few months, I've been talking to a whole variety of people about those markets, because this has got to be market driven. Although I, I have to be honest with you, we cannot allow the profitability of the logging sector to be the only driver. We have to assist that. And so the ideas on the, on the wood straw, uh, the fellow that's making the wood straw, 450 pound bales, and then dropping them on a burned forest or a reclamation project, that's that's where part of that is, um, you know, fiber, not fiber, board, wood board, um, mm -hmm. manufacturing, investing, a community investing in a manufacturing plant. Northwest Colorado and Southwest Wyoming have significant job losses because of the, what's happening in the energy sector. We think there could be a, a forest industry um, change that we would bring people into the forest to do those kinds of deals. And so I, what I would suggest from you all, and I think it's inherent in a lot of the uh, IRA dollars, is, is a uh, research component to come up with those kind of solutions. But in just the short time that I've worked on it recently, solutions are popping up. It's just a matter of then implementing. And, you know, I've asked the Forest Service people in my area, what's the forest of the future? And I get a blank stare. 
because we're not planning for the future, which is a climate-driven new reality. We're, we're essentially allowing sort of the old system to, that hasn't worked to perpetuate. Thank you. Senator um, Risch. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> and thank you to the panel for being here today. Uh, the, uh, th this issue has been around for a long, long time, and it's one, been one of the real frustrations I've had uh, since I've been here, is we talk about it, we pass laws, and yet every year uh, in Idaho we have more acres burn, we have more smoke, and this is true all over the uh, West. Uh, Pat, I'm glad you're here because, and brought that picture particularly, there's 535 members of Congress, and I doubt there's but a handful that have seen pictures, have been on ground that looks like this with a, with a lodgepole pine uh, a catastrophe like that, and, uh, and it's happening all, o all over the West. You know, <clears throat> this uh, fire that happened this summer in the giant sequoias, if that didn't break a person's heart, they are a very unfeeling person. I mean, the, the, the giant sequoias that we have in America are known all over the world. The only more famous patch is the Cedars of Lebanon, and the only reason they're more famous is because they're included in the Bible. Uh, if, the, if the authors of the Bible knew about the sequoias, they'd have included uh, at least some uh, head nod to them also. But look, when, that, when we can't even protect a, a national heritage like the uh, giant sequoias, it's really time to take a look at what we're doing when it comes to, uh, to fire suppression. And like I said, it's getting worse every year. We all sit here, we wring our hands about it, we pass all these laws, and yet it just, uh, it just continues to get worse. So uh, uh, thank you for being here, Pat, to, to lay this out, uh, particularly uh, where you deal with all the agencies and, uh, and have a good, clear understanding uh, of the kinds of issues that we face out there on the ground. Wyoming uh, is, is a lot like Idaho. We, two out of every three acres in Idaho is owned by the federal government. And uh, with all due respect to my friends uh, in the federal government, uh, they don't take care of the land like state land that we have, and even more so like private landowners take care of their land. Uh, obviously, it's a necessity for us. So uh, in any event, I hope we're going to take a, take a markup on one of these at some time in the new distant, Absolutely. In, uh, too distant future and, and actually scrutinize these, not for messaging, but for real, actual work on the ground. I know Senator Heinrich is involved uh, or is in, interested in this. Uh, he, he's been a, uh, a, a vocal proponent, like a lot of us have from out west, that we've just got to do things differently than we've been doing. It, it, it's, what we're doing is not working, and it, it really will take some major changes to make it work and not some fiddling around on the edges. So, again, thank you all for being here. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing. Thank you, Senator. And now we have Senator Cantwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for this important hearing on so many uh, different talk topics, but I would like to ask Mr. Uh, Crockett and Mr. Rupert, obviously fire season is never far from our mind in the Northwest, and um, <coughs> the issues that we have been facing just continue to grow in size. In late September, we still have crews on the ground working around the clock in Washington to contain and suppress wildfires. The Bolt Creek Fire continued to shut down Highway 2, uh, stopping commerce on that route that is used for transportation goods and getting agricultural products to market. This is kind of a new normal, and uh, we need to have more innovation and collaboration. Uh, Washington State forest managers have led the way in collaborating with federal and private landowners to get critical forest management done in these areas. On the Umatilla National Forest in southwest Washington, the National Forest has successfully used existing authorities to expand landscape scale prescribed fire planning off national forest lands to include state fish and wildlife lands gaining efficiency and scale. In north central Washington, the same method was used recently to extend NEPA planning to cover adjacent private lands and efficiencies in planning. And, but however, there are challenges in implementing the north central project, which is why we need more funding to allow federal, state, and private entities to coordinate uh, using all their existing authorities. This is important because we know fire doesn't stay within the federal boundaries, and obviously we need the cooperation. So, Mr. Crockett and Mr. Rupert, are you aware of the collaborative approach from Washington and its state management? How are you using existing authorities um, that have been successful in our state and the region, and how can this approach be replicated and used as a national strategy? All right, I'll start. So thank you for the question. So yes, uh, 
I am aware of the collaborative approaches that the state of Washington has been able to um, uh, undertake. I think one of the um, uh, one of the key programs, the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program, has been key to um, uh, much of the work that's been able to be accomplished, not only in the state of Washington but but nationally as well. Um, so, from the Forest Service perspective, we do value the role that collaboration plays in helping us be successful with uh, meeting our restoration objectives. Um, Yes, also, thank you, also aware um, of the efforts in Washington and, and um, actually would, would like to briefly talk about um, some of the work that we've done um, with the National Association of State Foresters, including um, um, the state forester um, in Washington, um, George Geisler. Um, we pi we've piloted some collaborative planning and reporting work um, in Washington over the last two years. Um, and starting this fall, we're expanding that work nationwide where we're looking at data sharing, um, geospatial um, mapping um, to, to more collaboratively report and plan risk reduction projects um, and the alignment um, of, of that, that work is, is I mean, it, it's, it's completely aligned with the risk reduction work that's going in Washington and in fact, um, um, it's connected through this pilot effort. I, I, so. I'm going to follow up with s some more details on that to get uh, kind of a commitment, if you will. This is something that came up in the hearing with my uh, with the chair um, several hearings ago about why there isn't more coordination with uh, individuals so that they can help. And so I want to follow up on that. But I do want to turn to the aerial resource issue. Our state has its own aerial firefighting program and 39 aircraft resources that it often sends to other states. Um, this is flexibility and contract that has allowed our state to utilize these authorities and provide help and support by federal legislation, including the Stafford Act. How many wildfire aerial assets does the Forest Service and the Department of Interior currently have? So thank you for the question. And I was actually in the state of Washington last week and had an opportunity to see some of the state uh, aerial resources in, uh, in Skamania, and uh, Jeff was there as well. So uh, for the Forest Service, we have over 400, don't have the exact number, but over 400 aerial assets um, uh, from helicopters to air tankers to uh, water scoopers to single engine air tankers that we were able to uh, access. Yes. Are you similar? talking about those that you contract with? Uh, it's a combination of owned and contract, so yes. Can we get a split on the difference between the owned versus the contract? Okay, I'll have to follow up with you, but yes. Uh, similarly for interior, um, uh, specific numbers, you know, between contract and owned and, um, um, uh, and various uh, sort of contract, you know, exclusive use versus um, 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 sort of call when needed, um, we'd have to pull that, that breakdown for you. But um, most of those aviation resources are shared between the two agencies. So um, large tankers, very large air tankers, um, the Forest Service administers, um, uh, single engine air tankers, interior administers. So for example, like right now, um, as of today, there are 63 available. We have access through call when needed contracts to, to hundreds more. Um, and, and helicopter assets, similarly, um, you know, today we have 50 available. We have access to over 200 additional through contracts. So should there's a be, pretty substantial. Should we uh, be reassessing the current <coughs> contracting regulations? Um, from my perspective, I'm not sure that that sort of assessment ever really stops. I mean, from my perspective, there's a very adaptive approach to contracting, and, you know, there have been shifts in recent years to how we approach contracting um, in these various categories, and, and from my perspective, I think we've seen some success in recent years. Yeah, and I was, I was hesitating because in, in the same spot, we're currently, we're, we're always assessing um, our regulations and contracts and availability, so it's an ongoing process for us. I think you're going to hear more and more about the needed resources in the West and the fact that, you know, on call is a little different when, you know, our whole strategy is hasty response, right, is to not get fires to scale. So I, you know, quite familiar with this with the past forest, forest, U.S. forest uh, director, and I think, uh, 
Yeah, we'll just follow up for the record, more questions here, but I, th I think we're only gonna see an acceleration of this. And I think the question is, how can those on-call assets really be as effective as we need them to be? I get once the fire's already at scale and then you decide to put in resources, but the problem is we have warmer conditions, at warmer and drier conditions everywhere, and we need more hasty response. And so how do we get that out of our aerial system? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator, Senator Daines. Chairman, thank you. Just earlier this month, the Cottonwood Environmental Law Center filed yet another notice of intent to sue the Forest Service based on consultation requirements established by the Ninth Circuit Cottonwood decision. The notice of intent demands the agency reinitiate consultation on the Northern Rockies Lynx Amendments, which covers 18 national forests and site-specific projects, many of which have already recently gone through reconsultation. I want to thank Chairman Manchin and the members of this committee for supporting my legislation, which would stop this very abuse by bad faith actors in the courts by codifying the position taken by the Obama Department of Justice. The Forest Service has previously testified on the workload and litigation risks that await us if Congress does not address this issue before the end of the year. And that's why I continue to believe any comprehensive environmental permitting bill must also include my bill that passed from this committee with strong bipartisan support, 16 to 4. Mr. Chairman, I know that you and Senator Capito are both eager to negotiate a bipartisan permitting bill that's considered as a standalone bill or perhaps adding it to the annual national defense measure. I will tell you if my cottonwood fix were included as part of permitting reform in that bipartisan agreement, you're likely gonna have my support. This provision is a critical first step to improving forest management. As I think about permitting, it comes in a lot of different forms. The cottonwood fix is one of those. Sustainable forest management creates sustainable rural economies. It leads to more carbon sequestration, important mitigation strategies that relate to warmer summers and longer fire seasons, healthier watersheds, and air and productive wildlife habitat. Better forest management can also help Montana's housing shortage. At one time, nearly one quarter of all new U.S. homes were built with lumber harvested from national forests, but now that number is actually closer to zero. We have to do more to manage our forests or our forests are gonna to continue to manage us. And that's why I've authored two bipartisan forest management bills that have already passed this committee. And I call on my colleagues to enact these common sense policies before the end of the year. Switching gears for a moment, Montana's Job Corps, it, these centers help train and prepare young Montanans to enter the workforce. In fact, in 2019, I was very glad to lead the fight in Congress to keep these centers open, serving our students and our communities. But now Congress and the Forest Service must work together to ensure these centers are the best they can be. The Civilian Conservation Center Enhancement Act does just this by expanding the forestry curriculum, ensuring that graduates have a pipeline of fulfilling careers and granting the Forest Service more flexibility in the day-to-day -day operation of the centers. This bill has the support of several organizations and I'd like to ask for unanimous consent to enter these letters of support into the record. Without objection. The Anaconda and Trapper Creep Job Corps Centers have already been seen successes in applying many of these same principles and goals are contained in this bill. I'm proud to support their ongoing efforts. I visited them, they're, they're great operations. I'm excited to see the success replicated in other centers across the country. Mr. Crockett, labor shortages are one of the top issues I hear about all across our state in Montana. How would my bill assist in establishing a pipeline of workers for the wood products sector? So thank you for the question and thank you for your uh, prior advocacy and current advocacy for those centers. Uh, the, so this bill would provide a pipeline for the CCC centers to um, uh, have a direct pipeline into the Forest Service. Really do like the direct hire authority uh, that's in there because um, that gives us the ability to go, the, the student to go directly from the center into employment with the Forest Service. So we, we do support it. Thank you. Thanks for that support. Thanks for your comments. Mr. Crockett, as you know, 
The lack of affordable housing is another contributing factor to labor issues we're seeing across this country and more specifically in Montana. In fact, according to a forest to market report, at one time, nearly a quarter of all new U.S. homes were built with lumber harvested from national forests. Today, that number is close to zero. At the end of the third quarter, Region 1's timber harvest was nearly 40% lower than it was at the same time last year. And last year, by the way, the Region 1 missed its timber volume target by around 30%. These downward trends are coming on the heels of Congress providing the Forest Service with, with unprecedented funding and new authorities. Mr. Crockett, what is the Forest Service doing to correct these significant declining trends and restore the health of our forests and, importantly, our wood product sector? So thank you for the question. Uh, and we do agree that having a, a balanced timber supply is uh, vitally important for the industry in the, in the area. So with a new funding that's been put in place through, through Bill and through IRA, we feel like that um, uh, those resources are going to help us um, stabilize and, and have that balanced flow of volume to, to the local meals in Region 1. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I know I'm uh, in extra range. I just have a final statement, and then I'll be, I'll be finished. Um, in contrast to the trends we've seen in our national forests, I will tell you our governor of Montana, Governor Gianforte, has doubled the amount of acres treated under good neighbor authority in just one year, and our state timberlands continue to be healthy, productive, and sustainable. It's such a contrast from our state lands to our federal lands back home. It's unreasonable to me, therefore, the Forest Service has not prioritized allocating good neighbor authority funds to states, and Montana wasn't asked for input on the GNA project that did receive funding. This contradicts the very principles that we have made GNA successful to date. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm out of time here, so uh, I'll respect that. And uh, well, thank you, Senator. We appreciate you, yeah. that, <laughs> <laughs> Senator Rona. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to briefly discuss the importance of S4884, the Natural Infrastructure Act of 2022. Natural infrastructure, or using nature as a way to reduce natural hazards like erosion and flooding, is becoming an increasingly popular and effective alternative to the more traditional so-called gray infrastructure solutions such as pipes and concrete throughout our country. Congress has recognized the benefits of natural infrastructure by passing bills directing agencies to prioritize projects that utilize natural infrastructure, like the 2016 Water Infrastructure Improvements for the Nation Act and the recent Senate passed Water Resources Development Act. Natural infrastructure provides a variety of ecosystem benefits, like helping to combat climate change, improving the health of watersheds, and protecting coastal communities, to name just a few. It is often more cost-effective than installing pipes or pouring concrete, and is preferred by local communities, and that's why I've introduced this important legislation. Natural infrastructure solutions are already popular in Hawaii. For example, groups all across the state have come together to form watershed partnerships, which work with local partners to protect forested watershed lands. Hawaii's forested watersheds recharge our island's water supplies, protect our ocean by controlling erosion, mitigate flooding, provide important plant and animal habitats, serve as recreational educational opportunities, protect public health by supplying clean water and air, support our local economy, and mitigate climate change by absorbing carbon dioxide. A study by the University of Hawaii estimates that the Ko'olau Mountains, which provide an estimated 135 billion gallons of water to Oahu residents each year, provided up to $14 billion worth of watershed services. Efforts to restore areas within the Ko'olau Mountains using natural infrastructure would likely be more, more cost-effective than efforts to replicate those watersheds watershed services via gray infrastructure. The myriad benefits provided by natural infrastructure ring true for the rest of the country as well. In the American Society of Civil Engineers 2021 report card for America's infrastructure, they note that increasing resilience across all infrastructure sectors can be achieved by including or enhancing natural or green infrastructure. 
However, the use of natural infrastructure is a relatively new concept as compared to gray infrastructure. As such, more science and information need to be generated to inform decision makers on whether the best solution for their infrastructure needs is natural, gray, or combination of the two. That's where my bill comes in. It requires the U.S. Forest Service the U.S. Geological Survey to establish a joint natural infrastructure science program that works with colleges and universities to supply the necessary research on, on natural infrastructure solutions. The research would be in direct response to the needs of civil engineers, local governments, developers, and the construction industry, ind individuals tasked with carrying out these projects. The bill also establishes a stakeholder advisory group made up of technical experts tasked with providing recommendations on both short and long-term natural infrastructure research needs. Finally, the Natural Infrastructure Bill requires the Secretary of the Interior to annually review existing natural infrastructure projects to assess their effectiveness and provide recommendations going forward on ways to improve the cost effectiveness of future natural infrastructure projects. As our communities face the increasing and oftentimes devastating impacts of climate change, natural infrastructure will become an increasingly important tool in our country's toolbox. I urge my colleagues to join me, and of course, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, to uh, advance S4884 out of our committee so that a more robust body of research and data can be available to inform the use of natural infrastructure throughout our country. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. You all were listening to all this, right? <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for the hearing this morning. Thank you to our witnesses. Uh, uh, we've heard some of the stories of tough fire season. We had another tough fire season in Alaska. Uh, 3,107, 378 acres burned so far. Apparently there's still some, some active within the state. Um, and then something that we haven't seen before. We, we saw two of the largest tundra fires on record in, in this state. Um, so we are paying attention as we always do. Now, I think we made some good progress with the infrastructure a bill that we passed in terms of providing some additional resources and authorities. And so a couple questions for both Mr. Rupert and Mr. Crockett this morning. In the, in the infrastructure bill, we provided uh, both DOI and Forest Service um, around $600 million to be made available for salaries and expenses of wild federal wildland firefighters between FY22 and FY26. So can you tell me um, how much of these funds are, are still available? It's, it's my understanding that um, we've, we're going to be looking at what we're calling in the approps world uh, a, a funding cliff um, in, in FY2024. So, how much is still available, and then what's the long-term strategy for both the departments in ensuring that we don't have this type of a, of a funding cliff uh, for firefighter salaries once the, the funding from the IIJA runs out? So Mr. Crockett, and then Mr. Rupert. So thank you for the question, Senator. So I don't have the exact number on how much is left, so we'll have to follow up with, uh, with you on that. Okay. But we did prioritize uh, 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 increasing the salaries for the first two years uh, for our firefighters. And it's a top priority for the administration. And what we'd like to do is just follow up with you on a, a creative solution for finding a, a long-term solution. Uh, As they, they have the increased salaries uh, resulted in um, uh, better either recruitment or retention? Uh, don't know those numbers just yeah, yet, it's but still it, uh, probably early. Yeah, yeah, do know that we have uh, uh, a lot of satisfied firefighters as a result of uh, them getting the funds earlier rather than stretching it out over the five year period. Yeah, okay. Mr. Rupert? Yes, thank you. Um, and just to reinforce the we are we are literally locked together on this issue um, as as we've provided as we're implementing um, that additional pay support this year. Um, um, we've, we've largely both talked about the math is, is working out that um, the support that we have in infrastructure for, for this temporary pay support um, 
um, we're projecting will last will last the two years, and at least in interiors, we've tracked that um, funding over the over the course of this year. That's sort of the path that we're on, um, and uh, and the uh, focus on identifying a long-term solution. Um, there's a laser focus on that. We have all hands on deck, um, working very closely um, with together, and then also with OPM. Um, on that, and I, our vision is that that long-term solution is ready to go, and there is essentially a seamless transition from infrastructure pay support to a long-term solution is the, is the vision that we well, have. Well, if, if both of you can get back with us just in terms of, of how, um, how, how much of the funds from IIJA are, are still available to, to you, I think that Maybe not from this committee's perspective, but from my probes hat, uh, that would be helpful for us to know. And then um, also, very quickly, because I have another question that I want to get to here, but both uh, the DOI and USDA got $50 million to assist in workforce training for non-federal firefighters and for our native village fire crews. You know, this has been an issue that I've been pushing for some time, um, and can you, can you give me any kind of a quick update in terms of that funding and what the departments have done to, uh, to help build out, whether it's native village fire crews um, or for our non-federal firefighters? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have those numbers at my fingertip okay. as well, and I'll have to follow up uh, okay. with that. All right, we'll wait for those then, too. Um, I'll just, just to add a little bit to that, um, in Interior, um, we very recently allocated training funding um, to support work out at the fire center, out at NIFSI with um, the National Wild and Fire Coordinating Group um, to, uh, to update um, um, qualifications and standards and all of that is foundational to the training that we provide across the entire interagency community. So it's work that, um, that will be ongoing that benefits the entire interagency community. Um, we also um, are, um, have have recently allocated um, some support um, for uh, additional training capacity um, with uh, within Interior with the Bureau training officers that um, has a strong connection to much of the online training system that we've developed and that we're jointly um, 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 utilizing um, that uh, reaches well beyond just federal Firefighters okay. and know that I'm going to keep community. pushing everybody all the time on our native village fire crews. There's nobody that knows the ground better than these folks. They live out there. They they know what's happening, and and when you talk about online, I know we're making great headway with uh, with what we put in the infrastructure bill with broadband, but online training for for many um, out in the rural areas like that just this doesn't work. I want to very quickly ask a, a question and I'm going to ask the indulgence of the chairman on this one because this is something that came to me just yesterday and this is a uh, forest service pressurization requirement um, for air tanker services. So it's my understanding that the forest service is set to release updated requirements for firefighting suppression aircraft on their multiple award task order contract and that for the first time they're requiring a pressurized cabin in firefighting aircraft. This previously, as I understand, was a consideration, but it was not a requirement. And I have looked at uh, questions that have been asked to the forest service about, you know, can you, can you, provide research studies or investigation in terms of why we are imposing this new requirement? Um, can you really show that pressurization drastically reduces crew fatigue, uh, results in greater safety? And I, I have to say, I'm a little bit surprised by, by the response that I see from Forest Service here that says that um, Pressurized aircraft do not guarantee safety, less fatigue, or fuel efficiency, but it does make these possible when an aircraft has it. Um, it, it effectively looks like the for, they, they say the Forest Service is committing to, committed to safety, fatigue management, using less fossil fuel when possible to cli combat climate change. But I, I, I guess I'm, I'm looking at that and saying, 
What we want to do uh, is we want to make sure that we get to a, a, a quick uh, a quick response. We want to get the fire out quickly. We obviously want to do it safety, safety, safety. But I look at this, and it seems that if you've got regulations like this that, that are potentially going to result in fewer air tankers available to rapidly respond and to suppress the, the fires, doesn't this then delay the response to the fires and then result in a wildfire that's just going to produce more greenhouse gases than you're, you're supposedly worried about saving um, with fuel efficiency. I'm trying to understand the logic here, and, and I, I, I don't understand why it has gone from a factor for consideration to now seemingly a requirement with not a lot of hard rationale to it. So, so I don't have a lot of details around the pressure, pressurization uh, uh, component of your question, but what I will say is that focus, so yes, we would like to have more aviation assets uh, available to us so that we can uh, be responsive to, to the fires when, when the fire bell rings. And we want to do that in a manner that, that is safely, uh, safely done, as you mentioned in, in your statement. So we'll have to follow up with you on the specifics for the pressuriz pressurization uh, uh, question. Uh, but I do know the, the, safe, the, the focus around safety is, is priority for us. As it should be. I, I guess I'd, I would just ask you to follow up with this because it's my understanding that this is going to be going into place like in a matter of days, if not weeks, if not days. Um, it's further my understanding that there were no Administrative Procedure Act process here like publishing a notice in the Federal Register for public comment before imposing this. So I've got a lot of questions here. Um, if if uh, round. if there wasn't adequate input, we'd certainly like to to understand that. I'll do second round if you want. I mean, real quick, I'll just go okay. to Catherine and come back. Sure. Senator Cortez Masto. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the panelists. Uh, so appreciate you being here, uh, Mr. Tool. It's great to see you again as well. Um, let me just say I also am interested in the answers uh, to the questions posed by Senator Murkowski. So as you provide the, that information, if you could provide it to my office as well, that I would really appreciate that. I am glad that the committee is holding uh, a hearing to discuss these important pieces of legislation. Uh, we need to use all of the tools at our disposal, and we need to innovatively think at how we protect our forests and rangelands through enhanced uh, wildfire mitigation techniques. Uh, that are so vital to our forest and rangeland uh, ecosystems in Nevada as well as the rest of the country. My Western Wildfire Support Act uh, would complement many uh, of the policies set forth in the bills that uh, we have discussed today. My bill received a hearing uh, in this committee a few months ago. Uh, it would provide at-risk communities across the Western United States with additional resources uh, to help prevent wildfires before they start. Uh, combat those that do um, uh, uh, spark a fire, and then help those communities impacted by wildfire to recover and rebuild. Uh, my bill would uh, allow communities in Nevada and across the western U.S. to acquire the training, the equipment, and funding they need to combat the increasing dangers posed by wild and rangeland fires that we're seeing across the western United States, including in Nevada. So I hope that this bill, in addition to the legislation discussed today, will soon receive further attention from this committee as well. And I join, I'd ask my uh, members to join me in this legislation. Uh, thank you, uh, gentlemen, for being here today to discuss this important legislation. And Mr. Chairman, I yield the remainder of my time to Senator Murkowski. I'm going to sneak one quick one. To Mr. Crockett and Mr. Rupert. Uh, in my opening remarks, I said over the last year, Congress provided you with more than $10 billion, $10 billion, uh, to carry out forest management projects on federal land. Okay. This is essentially a tripling of your entire discretionary budget and nearly a tenfold increase in several of your budgets for specific programs like vegetation management. I, I can't understand why you're not getting more accomplished with the funding that we provided. And uh, if, if this is, tell us what the, what's preventing you all from using this money as expediently as you can and as effectively as you can. So um, how many of these acres have you significantly changed uh, the conditions on to date? What would you think you've accomplished? 
The infrastructure bipartisan specifically required you to use the money and other funding Congress has provided significantly changed the risk from wildfire on 10 million acres or half of the land your scientists have identified as posing the greatest hazard. Where do you stand and why are we not doing anything? So I'll, I'll jump in here. So uh, we certainly appreciate the, the funds that the Congress has provided <laughs> to us. And um, um, so as I mentioned in, uh, in my opening statements around the connection to those funds, we consider them as a down payment for our success related to the, the wildfire conditions. Um, uh, we don't think you, I mean, you got to be honest, we're not being, we just don't think the success is there. We have anything to show for the $10 billion of public funds been invested. Right. So it's, so to be clear, it's a 10 year strategy. So we're in the early stages of, of it now with implementing it. So um, it's going to, it's going to take some a couple of years before we get to that measurable. What success. you're seeing is you're seeing bills being introduced to bypass you off. We have to say, say it again. We're, 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 you're seeing bills being introduced to do some bypassing if we have to. I'll give you the bill that I introduced. I couldn't make any sense at all. If there is a logging company that basically has a permit to log on federal government, federal land and they see a lightning strike by law, they can't go fight that fire. They have to call. And by the time the first responders get, or whoever your firefighters, this is a raging force fire out of control. So the reason we brought the law and the reason I brought the law into to play now is that basically, no different than a coal mine, every logging company permitted on federal lands, their no, permit's not going to be even entertained if they don't have a certified firefighting team on their, you know, that means we train coal miners that are mining the coal to actually be the first responders in case because they're certified as rescuers until the, the cavalry come. That's all we're asking for. We can prevent a lot of these fires if we stop them before they get going. Sure, and our, and our chief has committed to finding a, a creative solution on that, I think the last time he, he testified on it. What I will, sh what I will share is uh, for uh, timber sale operators who have a contract with the Forest Service, generally there's a stipulation in their contract that allows them to do initial attack until that incident is set up. So we can look at ways of, uh, of um, uh, expanding that work to provide more opportunities. Here's the thing, I'm running out of time because we have to go vote and I hear the, hear the bells going off, but uh, what I will say this, we, we liked it and we will look for an accounting of how you've spent the money, how you've invested, what you've done with it, and what type of track you're on right now because we can't explain it, I can. And my counsel here and all the people that work with me are having a hard time. So if we can get with your staff, and someone can show us a roadmap of what you've done and what you're going to do. And if we can expedite that, help you in any way. If not, we've got to make some adjustments and changes. With that, Senator Mikowski, I'll go right to you real quick. Thank you. And just to, to follow up with the discussion um, about the pressurization requirement, um, again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand if, if Forest Service has made this commitment for requirement. Um, so can you tell me, uh, Mr. Crockett, tell if... If this requirement is going in place um, in October, as as I've been told, is that your understanding? So I'm not I'm not familiar enough with it to know the details of what it uh, when it's going to go into effect. Because timeliness is is a, a concern here, we will definitely follow up with you um, um, pretty quick to to determine those dates of when it's going to go out. Well, uh, again, this is something that. Um, I've been read into it just just this week. Uh, um, you know, understand that there are uh, there's a company out there that has some P3s up there that used to be pressurized. They took the pressurization out because it basically was 600 extra pounds uh, of weight. And when you're looking for for fuel efficiency, it it helps when your aircraft is not so loaded. Um, uh, but that if this pressurization requirement does advance, um, you, you basically have four aircraft that you have had previously available to you that are, are, are no longer in place. And, and I don't think that this is just about one company. I'm, my, my concern is, is that this is going to be a broader policy um, uh, going forward that, that will, will impact um, uh, more, more aircraft that are providing these necessary services, again, at a time when we're seeing a, a heightened and a, and a growing need for, for that aircraft support. So 
I, I guess what I would ask of you, and it doesn't sound like you have a lot of familiarity or information for me at this point in time, but if you can get back to me, what I'm, what I'm looking for is I want to understand um, why, why we haven't gone through uh, the APA requirements with regards to, to publishing a notice for, for, for comment before deciding to move forward with the requirement. Um, what actually the Forest Service did then in order to get comment, I'd be curious to know what kind of negative comment you, you received on that. But what, what probably is, is more important than even that is to understand what, uh, what background, what research, what studies, what investigations Forest Service has done that has moved you to this place where uh, you're, you're, you're looking at imposing this new requirement of, of pressurization. So whether or not there have been any studies out there that show that, that pressurization really does reduce crew fatigue. Okay, that would be important to know. Um, whether or not there have been any, uh, any crashes that NTSB has attributed to lack of pressurization. So if you can just help us with this, with this background um, understanding why this step is being taken um, and, and what the Forest Service process was that, that got us to this point. Um, because again, what we're all trying to do, we're all on the same side here. We all want to focus on safety, safety, safety. Um, and, and so what we do to make sure that that safety is paramount is key. But if, if what we're looking at here is we just want these aircraft to, to, to be more climate friendly, um, but in fact it doesn't create any more um, safety benefits and it doesn't necessarily make them more efficient, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that this is the best space because if we have fewer aircraft up there, it just means a slower response and room for, for tougher fires for our extraordinary men and women who are fighting these fires to take on. So if you can get back to me with that information, and it sounds like Senator Cortez Masto is also equally interested in that. I, I would appreciate it. Okay, we will follow up. Super, thank you. Let me thank, thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. They're, they're calling for us for the votes. They are. Yeah. Anyway, let me just thank you all. I think you've done a great job. You see the interest that we have. Mr. Toy, I just thank you. I mean, you're, you're on the front lines there, and we, we really need your input. James, it's, it's, you do too. I mean, you guys are out there, and, and, and I think the only feedback we get is people out there actually doing the job that we need done and finding out what the impediments might be for you to do a much better job, and then we've got to get through this BS and politics and common sense and make it happen. That's what we're here to do, and also to help you all. You know, sometimes we make it so complicated writing a piece of legislation that you're covering this and covering every angle you can. Uh, so litigation, I mean, we're afraid to death of of the uh, litigious um, mental state that this country gotten itself into. We gotta do stuff, we gotta perform now, we gotta produce. So that's what we're gonna try to get done. So I wanna thank all of you for joining this morning for this discussion, it's been great. Members will have until the close of business tomorrow to submit additional questions for the record. The committee stands adjourned. Thank you.